Good morning. It's good to be with you all. So we're going to be focusing on a couple of passages today uh, that had a, a, a common theme, uh, wisdom and goodness and peace. The first is the, uh, the 34th Psalm, starting in verse 9. The psalmist says, O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life? and covets many days to enjoy good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And now a passage from Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus starting in chapter 5, 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This week, summer is uh, winding down. Many of us are getting ready to head back to school the state, the country, the world, all continue to be in the, in the grip of a, of a pandemic. And we all continue to be bombarded, barraged with loud, angry rhetoric, misinformation, wild conspiracy theories about every imaginable thing. And this week we have, from the lectionary, a collection of passages touching on the theme of wisdom. And it's a wisdom that's linked with goodness and peace. Just pause for a second to, to consider that all by itself. A wisdom that is interconnected with goodness and peace. The passages weave all these things together as if they were somehow inseparable. To have one is to have the others. To lose one is, is to lose the others as well. Now, I don't know, now I know all of you will find this uh, impossible to believe, but prior to becoming the, uh, the model of wisdom you, you see before you, <laughs> I have on occasion been wrong. And I have even said and done some pretty stupid things in my life. Let's not worry about the details. And of course, I don't like to uh, think of myself as being stupid. Uh, in fact, that, that's a word we don't use at our house. My girls are probably going to give me an earful after I sit down. But we all like to think of ourselves as not only intelligent, but wise. We can see this uh, by thinking, for example, about typical disasters, disaster stories, or catastrophe stories, sunken boats, earthquakes, an island of, of cloned dinosaurs, stray asteroids, alien invasions, pandemics. There's usually the lone, wise, prophetic figure who can read the writing on the wall, and then there are all the other characters who are selfish, power-hungry, corrupt, lazy, 
and above all, stupid. The same is true when we look at stories of the past. When we encounter these stories, of course, it's natural for us to identify with the one who can see what's coming, who can read the signs. We resist identifying with those who cannot or who refuse to. The willfully ignorant, the unwise and foolish. And we tend to assume that if we had been there with them, we would be standing with the knowledgeable and wise and good, rather than with the ignorant, the foolish, the bad. Along related lines, we, th we think foolishness in our own time, in our own context, in real life, will be easy to avoid because it will be obviously stupid, right? And we avoid what's obviously stupid. It's easy to think this way. It's easy to think that we are always rational because we don't want to think of ourselves as being wrong. And we also likewise tend to think that our minds kind of float above, detached from the other aspects of our lives and contexts. Once we leave junior high, we are completely uninfluenced by peer pressure, popularity contests, trends and fashions in thought and action. We are not lemmings jumping off the cliff with all the others. We are not sheep following dumbly and blindly. My choices are always governed by cold, unassailable logic. But have you ever noticed that it's always the person who disagrees with you that's the lemming? It's always the person on the other side who seems most like a, a dumb sheep, right? This is one way of saying that we all like to think that unlike others, we are perfectly rational creatures. However, we cannot all be right about this all the time, right? Some of us must think that we're right, but be mistaken, at least occasionally, right? The truth is that peer pressure, trends, fashions, patterns and waves of thought and behavior are with us throughout our lives. They pervade cultures and eras. They sweep over us at birth and never stop trying to mold us and shape us. To take one just run-of-the-mill example. Stand up if you're wearing a toga or a cape. No one? No, we really should bring back capes. Who decided to get rid of capes? And now how many of us are wearing something that falls somewhere within the range of typical modern Western clothing? Every last one of us. You can tell yourself that fashions aren't powerful forces, and in response I will point out to you that the, the power of fashion has been strong enough to bring the 80s and early 90s back from the dead. <laughs> Who would have thought? And what I'm talking about is, is true about of every aspect of our identity. It applies not simply to the clothes we wear and the, the food we eat, but to what we care about, what we think about, the way we think about ourselves and everything around us, how we reach conclusions and make our way in the world. Our minds and our deepest desires are shaped and reshaped, pushed and pulled and tugged on by all sorts of things. And this happens much more than we realize. This means that wisdom, like goodness and justice and real life-giving peace, it's not the kind of thing for which we can simply sit back passively and wait. These things are not simple or easy, and they're not always obvious to us. To borrow a, a metaphor from Aristotle, these things are kind of like targets that we aim towards. On a target, what's easy is to miss the center. The hard thing is to hit the bullseye. There are a lot more ways to miss than there are to hit the target in the center. Now listen again to the words of Psalm 34. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. 
Goodness and peace, and I think wisdom too, are things that we can only obtain by sustained effort, by pursuit, as the psalmist says, by having, having our wills, our lives, our hearts, our imaginations, our attention bent towards them, always being wary of the fact that they won't be easy to obtain. Goodness and wisdom and real peace are not easy to catch because there are many ways to miss them or avoid them or resist them. There are many things standing in the way of them, including, ironically, our own desire to be right and the corresponding desire not to be wrong or foolish. But let me come back to that in a second. We all have this basic desire to make sense of our lives and our world and to be at peace. We want a world that's rational, something orderly that we can understand and predict and therefore control, at least to some extent. This is perfectly normal and rational. In particular, we want this kind of rational order because it helps us to make sense of the disorder, of the unexpected. What we need then is a way of making sense of the world, a worldview, a story, and an all-encompassing atmosphere for the whole of reality. So that even those outlier events, the frightening, the worrying, the confusing, can make sense to us. Over the last year and a half, we have faced uncertainty and confusion, anger and pain and deceit. Many of us right now, as we head towards another time of transition, are worried and angry and anxious and scared. We wonder what is actually true about this or that. What's the right choice to make for, for me or my parents or my children if I do this or that? What will happen to us? And it's precisely during this kind of moment when we feel most strongly the need to cling to something solid and certain and stable, something that makes sense of things and eases the burden of all these choices we have to make all the time, something that will make these choices a little bit easier. And I want you to know I feel that same desperate need myself as we're sending our kids back to school next week. Like most people, I think, I'm tempted to latch on to the first thing that makes me feel a little bit of comfort and peace. And one thing that offers me a quick burst of comfort and peace is burrowing unquestioningly further and further down into what I already think or something which amounts to the same thing, reveling in a victory over someone that I consider to be an opponent. But this is when it's most important to sustain our attention on that connection between wisdom and goodness and peace. They can only be had together, and so they must be pursued or sought out together. Wisdom cannot be had without the pursuit of goodness and peace. Thus, for example, if the person or persons I am listening to, even if they seem to make a lot of sense, if they tend to degrade or mock or oversimplify or dismiss without consideration the person or view they disagree with, that's a red flag that there's more at work here than the dispassionate pursuit of the truth. That's a red flag that their main goal is not figuring out what's true and good, even if it means admitting that they are wrong. If I'm mocking and dismissing my opponent, or if the voices I'm listening to are mocking or dismissing their opponents, then the main goal has become defeating the opponent, crushing them, knocking them down. And it's really easy to drink this kind of thing in, especially when we're confused or stressed. Watching someone you might disagree with being taken down a notch triggers this rush of energy. It gives you that sense of victory and control that we all want. 
but the result is not goodness or real peace or wisdom, but something empty, empty and hopeless. And instead of leading me to ask and really wrestle carefully with hard questions, even about my own beliefs, instead of leading me to patiently seek evidence and consensus from experts, this kind of thing only reinforces what I already think. Augustine talked about something like this tendency 1,600 years ago on the first page of one of his major treatises on the nature of God. He spoke of people who wish to give the impression of knowing and they block their own road to genuine understanding by asserting too absolutely their own presumptuous opinions. And then rather than change a misconceived opinion they've defended, they prefer to leave it uncorrected. I want to pause here to note something else related to this, which is that although we might talk a good game, it's not easy to give up something we already think, especially if that something has become somehow tied up with our identity, our deepest needs and desires and passions. There's a kind of stickiness to those kinds of beliefs. We have a, a difficult time letting go, even in the face of evidence. This tenacity we have to hold on to what we believe, it's not always problematic. If you told me, told me that my wife is actually an infamous cattle rustler or bank robber or something, even if you presented me with video evidence and witness statements, if I just said, oh yeah, that makes sense, you would think there's something wrong with me, right? I shouldn't just give up my belief that my wife is not a cattle rustler very easily. However, this can be a serious problem when it becomes impossible for us to change our minds, even in the face of evidence and the consensus of experts. This is not wisdom or goodness or real peace. This is pride. This is getting drunk on my own love of self and justifying it by calling it wisdom. Come back to Ephesians with me one last time. It's a classic Church of Christ proof text. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Paul describes the Christians in Ephesus singing and making melody to the Lord in their hearts. Despite what I thought for much of my life, this passage has nothing to do with instruments. Nothing. And it's important to recognize that and put it bluntly because when we get distracted by things like that, we fail to see the, the real and vital message expressed in that passage. Listen to it again. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled instead with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, you're all immersed in a culture of self-indulgence and ego and love of power and pride and arrogance and rumors and half-truths and ignorance and false wisdom. This ocean of emptiness is disguised as wisdom and victory and power and a real source of hope. And so we're drawn to give ourselves over 
to it entirely, to drink it up, to try to be filled up with it. But the truth is it's empty. It will only leave us thirstier than we were before. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, he says. Drink in the Spirit of truth and wisdom and real peace. Give yourself, body, mind, and heart over to the Spirit of God. Christianity, in other words, does not consist in following rules about instrumental music. Christianity is also not to be turned into a facade to cover our own love of power and self-centeredness. Try, though we might, to turn it into that. Christianity is the giving over of our hearts and minds, our love, our brokenness, our desperation and need over to the God who can truly fill us up and make us whole as he makes us his body in Christ through the power of his spirit. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we pause to express our gratitude for your presence, for your love. We pray that you would melt down our pride, our, take away our foolishness, fill us with a spirit of wisdom, empower us to, to turn our hearts, our deepest desires, our minds toward wisdom and goodness and real peace. We pray all things through Christ our Lord. Amen.